It's me. Yeah, we're going to do special relativity. And really, it's general relativity also. There's only one relativity. There's a fact of the universe. And so this is the twin paradox. The whole, you go shooting yourself through space. Uh, you go a whole bunch of distance really, really fast. You come back again. And you somehow are, um, well, you're not as old. It's just that simple. The people who stayed on Earth uh, aged quicker um, because their metabolism did less, and that's the simple answer. But I'll prove it <laughs> yeah, in a better way. I'll explain where they do, you know, they do these thought experiments fairly wrong. And, um, yeah, I, you know, if I do this right, you should be impressed because it really does explain it all. So I guess the first, uh, the, the biggest statement I guess I would make um, is, is to first understand um, that the I'm arguing that the universe's geometry is all square geometry. There's there's no circles in the fundamental elements of the universe. So the three dimensions can only be entered by a specific Planck minimum distance. You you can't go a half a Planck. You can't do a quarter Planck. You must if you're going to go up or you're going to go right or left or up down back forward you must travel at least a Planck distance in that dimension, straight in that dimension, not this way, that way. So think of it as a cubed universe, and you can only move the cubes, you know, like a Rubik's Cube. You can only move the squares. You can't, you can't move something other than a square distance. Um, and then this all gets really easy to understand in that when you travel in some dimension, <laughs> you have to extract the time from the other dimensions, meaning you have to extract movement time. So you can't move in the other directions the same amount of spaces if you're moving in some other direction spaces. So you only have so many spaces you can move, understood, per second, and you do them in those three dimensions. And that's it. It's that simple you're always moving in that your squares will always go up, down, right, left, and they can do it in perfect balance and you can just, you know, that's what you're doing. But if you have velocity, which inevitably you're going to have just because it's all relative and we're all doing something in the universe, so to speak, we're in some place that's been affected. That's how matter got created in the first place is there was an effect. Um, a filtering of <laughs> force, energy, or whatever, and uh, so you're likely moving. It's very hard to find a. It's probably very hard to find a place where you can. You can't just place something into the universe. You have to move it into the universe, and so just you know, the very idea of moving it into the universe means you're probably going to be moving when you get there. Um, but anyway, not really the point. But the point is, is this is all. Um, if you understand it in that sense, is that you can't do something in one dimension without compromising what you were doing in the other dimensions. So you can't move forward without taking away from whatever, if you were going right or you're going left, or you're going down or you're going up, you're now not going to be able to go up or down or right or left at the same rate because now you have to spend some of your time <coughs> going forward. And so everything is a, a jagged line. All right, so the, the really important thing, I guess, to understand about velocity is, so take an orbit. And somebody says, this is your orbital speed. And they'll say you're going, say, 30,000 miles uh, a second. The truth is, is if I release you from that orbit, you're still going 30,000 miles a second. Now, even though in the orbit, under gravity, there's a presumption that you must be going faster because there's that acceleration towards the Earth or whatever you're orbiting. And yet... It doesn't reveal itself when I release you from the gravity. Somehow, that velocity that you have gained from that acceleration doesn't reveal itself. So my argument would be is that's because you're you're, you're only registering when you're you can't register the um, velocity of the acceleration. It doesn't reveal itself because of the circular motion. So what you're really doing is traveling in a least line of more distance to get to 
from point A to point B. So you're traveling in the other direction. And sort of the geometry is in this, exper this thought experiment about um, special relativity has a lot of these elements because you're basically using this geometry. Um, but they take the third dimension out of it to make it two-dimensional in the first place, which is sort of okay because most of our most accelerations are going to be a, a flat circle, so it's going to be sort of two-dimensional. You're not going to have to worry about how much the satellite moves up and down as it's orbiting something in terms of de deciding its velocity. But at, at any rate, the point is that the further out you are, the your releasing lines um, is is you'll, you'll travel. You'll, they'll be bigger, and the closer you are, the the more gravity you're in, the finer the releasing lines, which means the more essentially the more uh, distance you'll have to travel, which means your velocity is higher than what it appears to be. So as I, I'm basically bouncing on the surface of the Earth, and that bounce means you have to add up the distance of the two dimensions I'm traveling in. I'm traveling that way, and I'm traveling that way. Those are two separate dimensions, and I can only travel in one dimension at a time. So I always must staircase. There's no such thing as the straight line. There's only the staircase. So you can't do any. All those movements count. So I'm just saying the real distance I travel, if I go at any diagonal, is really the distance of the two dimensions. I really went the full length of the two dimensions. And so I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. And that those two dimensions add up to more distance in the stronger gravity because that the line of your distance down is a bigger line. So you can sort of see if I made a triangle here in front of you. And this distance was the amount I go that way, and this distance was the amount I go down. You can sort of see that the stronger the gravity I'm in, the more I'll go down. And so there's a bigger um, jolt to my aleasing line. I guess that's really the better way to say it. It's not that the aleasing is finer. It's that I'm at a, it's like a higher frequency radio wave versus a lower frequency. I'm moving up and down more often, or there's higher amplitude to my frequency. I guess that would be the way to say it. My, the amplitude of my frequency of my bouncing, my aleasing, my staircase, has higher steps. So I'm definitely going a lot more distance overall because I'm climbing higher steps of acceleration. And so that's really the absolute fact of your, your velocity. Your velocity is measured, if you could see the staircase, then you could measure the actual distance you travel, not this line. You don't do this thing where you, know, where you do a round circle. Because that's, that's square, the square geometry says you have to do it in a staircase. So you have to travel the full dimensional space. Um, yeah, and so if you understand it that way, then you understand why GPS is really confusing. See, she, I guess she must have a GPS uh, video. I'll have to look that up. Um, because that's the catch. You know, special relativity makes it so the satellites, um, you know, are actually, you know, their clocks are actually moving slower, faster. And then it's only with general relativity that you end up making the clocks go slower. No, they end up going faster. Okay, so with special relativity, the clocks on the satellites go slower. And then when you add general relativity, the acceleration component, you find that the clocks are actually running faster because we on the ground are actually moving faster than the satellites. We have an absolute velocity higher than the satellites. And I guess that's the point I'm getting to. If you understand the geometry, you understand that the three dimensions have to be interacted with in complete Planck components, uh, and that that in, you know, includes the time it takes. So it's the amount of distance plus the absolute amount of time, and that you can't, you can't fudge it in any way. You have to move into the dimension in a complete manner, and then move in the other dimension in a complete manner. You can't do anything outside that square geometry. Um, you understand that that's the nature of the absolute. That's the grid that'll define your absolute movement. Okay. 
<sighs> so that's probably enough of a precursor. I guess I would just point out that you know I did look up some numbers. So so the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. 186,000 miles per second. The fastest satellite we've ever made, or will make uh, soon, goes 25 miles per second. 25. Tiny amount of velocity. And so you're not going to realize too much of an effect. You're talking about one second every two hours, something like that, in terms of the participation rate, how much time you have to spend in that other dimension. So the only, the dimensional change is this way. If you had 7,000 moves you were making, you'll still make 6,999 6, of them in the same dimensions you were working in before, and only one of them will be in that other dimension. That's how tiny that velocity is, uh, as an absolute velocity. Now, obviously, you could have other velocities based on other comparisons to what would be the absolute. We can't detect or easily detect our absolute velocity. But maybe I can figure out a way to do that somewhere in here. Um, but, yeah, so, so, you know, another comparison would be, okay, the speed of light is 186,000 miles a second, and a bullet is going 0.5 miles per second. Just to give you some sort of idea. You know, a GPS satellite is only going 2.4 miles per second. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, tiny fraction of the speeds that people would talk about in these paradoxes um, for them to be meaningful. But they really do underestimate it because what they end up doing is taking hypotenuses of an all wrong. <laughs> the dimensional, well anyway, we'll probably have to draw a picture of it, but we'll get there. So let's just play this and I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain how what I just said is relevant to what they're saying. Did you know that you could be older than your twin? Like, years older? According to Einstein's theory of special relativity, it's possible because time... Okay, so what's really argued here is that you don't you'll be exactly the same age this like okay here's my example so all the people who know about how they do these thought experiments the clock and the light and the bouncing and all that kind of crap just ignore all that and use a, a neutron star or something that's common to both perspectives so you can see it from earth you can see it from your spaceship going half the speed of light or whatever and you're both can look right at it and it's a standard clock so that's all you need is a standard clock and you know there's nothing different about how much time passed what's different is you age less if you're in the rocket and you only age less as I just stated is because you did a bunch of movement in one dimension and moving in that dimension meant you had to steal it from the other two dimensions that means everything that was doing something else is not doing that anymore some part of the time it's doing this other thing and, and for a GPS satellite I said it would be <laughs> one seventy-seventh thousandth of the time so that's how tiny it is at these speeds even though these speeds seem like a lot I mean even though 25 miles per second sounds pretty fast it means that only one out of seven thousand seconds you'll be doing this other thing this moving thing in terms of seconds of activity in the other two dimensions. So for every 7,000 seconds of activity in the other two dimensions, you know, your metabolism, seeing, thinking, you lose one of them every 7,000. One, every, one, it's, like, it's like having it, like, if you were going 25,000 miles per second, what would basically be happening is every 7,000 seconds, you just pass out for a second. You just don't experience the next second. And that's kind of what's happening. You just don't experience it. You don't get any older, nothing happens. You just stop and then you continue on the next second. So it's just about how many seconds you're losing of, your, of, of experience. 
that's really all that this this is a conversation about your body experiences less seconds your brain experiences less seconds you're just experiencing less seconds because you've used a bunch of them you know perceptual seconds conscious seconds because you're using a bunch of them to move can tick faster or slower depending on how you're moving clocks clocks will tick slower that's right so it all depends on what kind of clock you use how much You'll, how accurately you'll measure time. But like I said, just the simple solution is just to make a common clock that isn't in either either one of the stupid frames. Make a common clock that's in a, a, an, a, an external frame, and you'll realize you're both going through the same amount of time. You're just experiencing it differently because you're freezing. You're, your metabolism is slowing down, and that's it. It's not complicated. You're just becoming a little bit cryogenic you're <laughs> you're going to um, you know obviously from the person moving that clock's going to seem to be running awful fast you know that standard clock it's going to look like as you, as you gain acceleration and say you're going faster and faster and you're getting up there to a half the speed of light or something that means that that second clock is going to be looking like it's going twice as fast you're going to be saying where's all the time going but the time's just going is because your frame rate is, is slowed way down. So you're just not seeing, you know, you think you're seeing at the same rate, but you're not. And so everything's coming at you much quicker. I mean, you're just, it's like your wits are dull. It's like you're in a boxing ring and you're, you know, <laughs> it's like everything's just not, you know, everything's surprising you because you're just not perceiving it. It's sneaking up on you. What? Yeah, we'll get back to that. But first, we're going to learn all of special relativity. Don't yeah. worry. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like you're going to learn, and it's all going to be because you're going to slant the perspective. You're going to you're going to pretend certain things are possible that wouldn't happen. That you can't create this scenario you're talking about and actually have it happen the way you're saying where your perception isn't going to change. You're saying, I'm going half the speed of light, I'm going to look at a clock, and I'm going to see it exactly the same. And Well, you're not, because your perception is broken. Only two postulates. One is that the laws of physics are the same for everyone's perspective, or frame of reference, while in uniform motion. <sighs> yeah, but that still doesn't account for the fact that um, there are absolute effects. So I'm just saying, I, I can just take this argument and say, <laughs> she does have a funny face. If, if, so, so what I'm basically arguing is as, as this frame starts moving faster, the, the frame starts to get invisible because there's less and less pixels making the frame and more and more pixels moving the frame, if you can get me. So the fast, let's just say the relationship was, the faster I make this frame go, the less trans, the more transparent it gets. So as I use more time to do this, I start to lose this. And so you can sort of understand if I move this, the speed of light, this goes completely invisible. There's no more, there's no more activity in these, two, in these dimensions because I'm using all the time to move in this direction. So you can see, you see what I'm saying? I mean, there's, there's three dimensions here. So let's just count these, the, the, let's just say these frames represent, um, you know, up, down, and forward back and that I start moving it this way you can see that to go this way to create frame in this direction I'm going to use all the pixels that were in this frame to do this frame so I'm going to wipe that frame out of existence so you know to say that they're all from all frames of reference everything's the same well it's not because in certain frames <laughs> you're going to be annihilated your function is going to cease so technically, there'll still be, there'll still be, let's say I turn you into energy moving in a direction. Say I go the speed, I take matter and I move at the speed of light. The interesting thing is there will still be a shadow of this reality. Even though all, all these pieces will move this way and they'll all be photons moving this way. It could be radio waves, it could be cosmic rays, it could be light rays. It doesn't really matter. All of this will turn into energy moving this way. But in fact, all of these positions will still be intact. So the, the, the idea of where each one of these little pixels was 
is still going to exist as a compression of of quanta and so you'll still have a shadow of this thing so theoretically if I started slowing it down that means I started giving back pixels to it it may be able to regenerate what was so you may not necessarily be destroyed by moving the speed of light because the shadow of what you were the the form of it the pattern the patterns still there it's just not an active pattern but as you reintroduce gravity and magnetism and electromechanic forces inside the atoms the, the atoms shape is still there it's just they're not spinning they're not vibrating they're not doing anything they're all move, all the bits are moving but they still have a position and theoretically that position may be regeneratable so in the past I thought it would be an annihilation but it's really about position and matter is really about a compression of quanta and that compression would still exist theoretically so that means that on a plane cruising at 800 kilometers per hour an object you drop will fall straight down just as it would if you're stationary on the runway same physics in those two yeah but the truth is it doesn't <laughs> so you could say it's going to fall straight down but technically it didn't the plane did move underneath it and in the time it took for the thing to go down the plane moved i mean it's an arc it's moving at this so you got you have to understand that what changed was is the plane moved down it accelerated also by by staying in the same gravitational pattern so obviously depending on the angle or pitch of the plane the thing is going to drop down in a different way it's not going to be down relative to your seat depending on the pitch of the plane so, so I mean you have to understand that, that, that it's only going to theoretically there still is a slight difference frames otherwise plane rides would get real weird the crazy implication no it, they wouldn't get real weird but you see this is one seven thousandth of so so as it's falling one seven thousandth of its essence moves here you know moves one tiny one seven thousandth of the overall distance in that other direction I mean it's a tiny percentage of its function is off of this postulate is that there's no experiment you could do to tell that you're moving even at 800 kilometers per hour even at a million kilometers per hour okay I, I mean a million kilometers per hour what's that let's see on my list what's a million kilometers per hour uh, let's see what moves that fast uh, 671 what the hell is that for 671 miles per hour I don't know where I got that from I mean I don't have any zeros on there <laughs> yeah I don't know what I wrote down that was the only miles per hour thing I had but anyway so okay so a million miles per hour um, I can't convert that in my head to seconds, so... Oh, never mind. But, I, I mean, obviously that's a preposterously fast speed. And, um... A million miles per hour. Uh, yes, well, I, 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 I can't... I mean, 300 <laughs> meters per second. I, I, I'm just, see, I can't do this conversion. Well, never mind. It doesn't matter. Um... But this idea that you can't tell, I guess what I'm arguing is that I think some of these effects, like when you're, when you start breaking down the atomic structure in the sense that so much time is spent in one dimension versus the other two dimensions, like that frame that starts getting transparent, I think what happens when that frame starts going transparent is that the mechanical functions are going to start breaking down, that positions are going to get lost, and your matter is going to disintegrate. I mean, it's going to disintegrate as a functioning, viable thing because the forces won't be able to hold it together anymore. Yeah. So, so realistically, I don't think you'll be able to retain your pattern because as you start moving those kinds of velocities, none of the internal nuclear forces are going to work right anymore Only tell you're moving relative to something else, like the clouds outside your window. The second postulate. Yeah, well, like I said, I think if you do have these kinds of preposterous, again, just recognize the fastest satellite we made is going 25 miles per second. 
and the speed of light is 186 miles per second. So just, again, 186,000 miles per second. Uh, you know, you have no idea how big a headache you might get going those kind of speeds. Is that the vacuum speed of light is the same for all observers. 300,000 kilometers per second. Let's just pause on that for a sec. Do you know how freaky this is? It means that if you're flying toward me in a spaceship going close to the speed of light and you shine a laser at me, you'll still measure that light to be going at 300,000 kilometers per second. All right, yeah, well, yeah, light is light. And, and the point is, is you have to think about light. You can't think about light like you're throwing a baseball. Because that's really not what it is. Light is something you let go of, and it goes. So it's like you have to think of light as not something you're pushing into space, but something you're dropping into space. So you just drop it and it goes boom. That's kind of what light is. So no matter where you drop it, it always goes the same speed. So it's you have to kind of think that you don't you're not allowed to give it any of your force. So the only thing you can change by moving is the frequency, how often you drop it. Okay, your frequency will get tighter and tighter the faster you're moving in the direction of the drop. But the light itself starts from zero and goes. And I'll measure the light to be going at 300,000 kilometers per second as well. So those are the only two postulates of special relativity. The speed of light is a constant, and the laws of physics are the same in every inertial reference frame. Well, again, the laws of physics being the same is a leap, just because, again, if you stretch uh, met metabolism, uh, atomic function, if you take an, just think, if you take an atom working in three dimensions, and then I all of a sudden force that atom to spend most of its time in one dimension, moving in one dimension, you can sort of get the idea, again, like, well, this is going to stretch the fuck out of that atom. And it's that stretching, this same kind of stretching they talk about with gravity and black holes and stuff, you're going to just stretch it so much that it's going to break down the nuclear forces that are holding the atom together. Inertial meaning not moving or moving at a constant velocity. Basically, you're not accelerating. And when you do accelerate, like when you experience turbulence or during takeoff when you're pushed back into your seat, you can tell you're moving and special relativity no longer applies. Well, again, it's, it's the, the fact that we can tell it just means that we've been built, constructed to detect gravity in that way. But I'm, you know, it, that's just a nuance of our biology and our sense organs. But, I mean, you could take away a couple of our senses and we couldn't tell. So it's just that we have senses that can feel pressure and feel things pushing against us. But that's not really the same as telling. So it's from just these two postulates that we derive an entire physical theory and get crazy things like length contraction and time dilation and other weird quirks of physics that... Well, again, see, it's not that weird if you understand that you can't, you can't take direction in one direction without stealing it from the other directions. If you understand the fundamental nature of conservation, then you can understand that everything has to be pushed into a new position. You can't just drag an atom and say, okay, well, all the little pieces are connected somehow with like steel girders and I can just move them. Well, that's not how the atomic structure works. It takes energy to keep those bonds together. And if you're moving one atom to another atom to another atom, there's real energy happening inside of the atoms. Um, so the illusion you have that it's all free, it's not free. You can't just... Whatever you push in has to go through every single bit of the matter and push every single bit. So you have to put enough quanta in to migrate the entire thing. All the little bits, technically. And if you're just using one little bit to move the whole thing, then you have to wait a long time for that one little bit to move the thing. So if you want to move something in one, one second, like say, say if you thought of the speed of light, okay, 100, 186 miles per second. So just think of a plank 186,000 meters long or something. Miles long. Shit, that's how, yeah. A hundred, so think of a piece of wood, 186,000 miles long. 
and you have to have enough speed to push the entire board off the table in one second. I mean, that's how, you know, just imagine how fast I'd have to move my hand to move 186,000 miles of wood off of a table. <laughs> you know, it's a really long table to be pushing everything off of. So, you know, that's the kind of, you can understand that that would require a huge amount of energy to be able to push that much matter off a table that quickly. But the longer I'm allowed to take to push it off, then the less energy I have to put in in terms of increments over time. I can take my time. I can hit it a little bit every day. Are real. One such quirk is that time can tick at different rates depending on how you're moving. We call So again, time can tick at different rates. No, clocks can function well or badly depending on how fast you're going. The only clock that really works is a standard clock that's sitting in some null space and not being affected. It's in all three dimensions evenly. That's the null space. So if you have a clock and you can put it in all three dimensions and it's moving in all three dimensions exactly the same amount, then you have a clock that's a standard clock. And then you can judge everything else based on that clock. But that's it. There's, there's no way of escaping the fact that your time-telling devices are just metabolism um, um, detecting devices. They're just they're just telling you how f how much you're how much you're sucking out of other dimensions. How 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 imbalanced your dimensions are. This time dilation. It's weird, but it's real. Well, again, it's not really real as dilation of anything called time. It's a dilation of your metabolism. So again, you are freezing your functions are slowing down because your functions can't do what they were doing because you're moving in another dimension. Why does it happen? Consider two frames. One is you stationary on Earth and one is your twin zooming by in a rocket. You have identical clocks. Let's look at yours first. Each time... I want to see it. <laughs> yeah. Identical clocks that have to function based on... that, that, are, be, that are being broken by the same rules that you're under. So if you're standing on Earth, the fact is you're spinning around, you're doing, you're having lots of velocity, and your clock is broken in a specific way. Your, your clock is already somewhat transparent because there's probably some imbalance in some vector, and that imbalance in some vector is breaking your clock. When light makes a round trip in your clock, you count by one. Your twin will measure the same rate on her own clock. Now, things get weird when you watch her clock because... All right, see, this watching somebody else's clock thing is the, is the bullshit. Um, because you're not watching... A, this person in here is not really watching the clock because they're moving with the, the spaceship. If they were standing here watching the clock and they stayed here and the ship moved, well, then they're watching the clock. But clearly, by moving away from the clock, they're not watching the clock. They're, they're moving away from it. So it's like me expecting my house to stay the same size as I'm moving away from it. That's not going to happen. Of her sideways motion, you see that her light has to travel a longer distance for one tip. Right. So this is the distance. But what they're not realizing by doing this... This, this, this is, as it's quite obvious, these are angles that I'm basically arguing the geometry doesn't allow. What you're really doing is you're moving up and you're moving forward. And that's what you're doing. These are the real dimensions. This is the real distance you traveled. This. You did this and then you did this. And there's no way of escaping that. You don't do any of this hypotenuse crap. And since the speed of light is the same for all observers, her round trip takes must take more time. So time. <clears throat> I think you wrote that the wrong way. <laughs> her clock ticks must take more. Yes, the, the a second seems longer, but it won't be showing up on her clock. It'll be showing up on the standard clock. So again, if if you just do that experiment and put the clock outside both of their frames of reference, 
they'll both see the clock do exactly the same thing in the sense that the same number of seconds will tick by. It's just the person moving is going to think, man, that clock's broken. It's running, it seems to be running too fast. Time actually ticks slower on her moving rocket according to you, stationary on Earth. And this is a real phenomenon. It well, again, real phenomenon if you're, in the sense that you're saying that the frame uh, has changed. And there's nothing in, there. no, the frame hasn't changed at all. You are moving. There's no frame. Uh, you're just absolutely changed your direction and by, you know, changed your, your, your occupation of those of the three dimensions. You've changed how much time you're spending moving in those three dimensions and by changing what percentage of the time you spend in a certain dimension, left, right, forward, up, down, you're changing what's happening in the other two dimensions. It's not some weird mind trick. We don't usually notice this though because time dilation is quite insignificant until you're moving close to the speed of light. Um. No, well, that's really not true. You know, half the speed of light means one in, you know, what I was saying, like like at, at 25 miles per second, it's only one in 7,000. You know, only you're only sacrificing in in dimensional function. You know, so, so the two dimensions you're working in, it's only one in 7,000 of the seconds, so to speak, that you're losing. But at half the speed of light, it's half the seconds. That's a lot of seconds, okay? So that's a big difference. 7,000 to 1 in, in 2. 1 in 7,000 versus 1 in 2. So even at half the speed of light, you have substantially taken function out of those two dimensions and thrown it into that one dimension. So now, from your twin's perspective, you are moving. Therefore, your clock must be running slower according to your twin. And because the laws of physics are the same in both of these frames, yours and hers, each frame is equally correct and same. Yeah, no. So each frame is not equally correct. And all you have to do to fix this is just put a neutron star out here. And both of these things will agree, yes, I saw it flash a certain number of times. They'll both say, after they, the whole thing's over, they'll both say, I saw it flash 25 times, or whatever, the, or 6,007,878 times. They'll both see that star flash the same number of times. And this person's basically going to be saying, I don't feel too good. It just didn't seem right. <laughs> you know, but they are going to be younger, because that's why they don't feel too good. It's because they just basically were frozen. And then de thawed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I guess they were de yeah they were de thawed when they got back home. They stopped moving. So yeah, they de thawed. And the other's clock is running slower. This is where the paradox starts. Imagine you and your twin start off on Earth. You stay here, but your twin zooms off in a spaceship at half the speed of light, turns around, and comes back. The whole trip takes 30 years, but you see your twin's clock ticks slower. So, due to time dilation during the journey, she only aged 26 years. Four years less than you. Yeah, not huge. So, yeah, I did see the, um, whatever it's called, uh, something science, DJ, Dr. Science, or whatever. You know, and he did a video, and then he used the math that somebody cooked up where... They, they actually went, you know, at 1G for 30 years <laughs> acceleration. And you're just like, oh, you can't do that, man. You'll be going 5 million times the speed of light. So he came out with an age difference of like 25,000 years or something, 56,000 years difference. But you're just like, come on. I mean, that's like warp, like 28 or something. You can't do that. Now, here's the crux of the problem. From your twin's perspective, she was stationary, and you, on Earth, moved away and came back. You well, again, you're saying the perspective crap, but the whole point is is that perspective is going to be based on how much time your atoms are spending in all three dimensions. And as soon as you steal time in one dimension, your function is going to be altered, and you're really not going to be perceiving things like everything's just fine.
for the one moving at half the speed of light. So your twin should see your clock going slower and should think you are only 26 years older by the end of the trip. So yeah, that's not possible. When your twin gets back, she's either younger or she's older. She can't be in a super position of both. This isn't quantum. So how do we solve this paradox? I guess I don't understand it. Like, again, there's no paradox. If you just put a clock outside both of them, they'll both agree on what exactly how many times the pendulum swung on that clock. And they'll both be able to rationally say, yes, I know that clock was right. So they'll know that the same amount of time passed, and they'll realize that the only thing that changed, really, was I wasn't conscious as much as you were. <laughs> and I wasn't, I didn't exist, pretty much. My frame disappeared for some portion of time, every amount of time. So every hour of time, 30 minutes of my time didn't happen for me. And the, but the universe kept happening, so I had to catch up. And so everything just moved really, really fast. I was, if I could look at you with a telescope, yeah, I would see you buzzing around, doing all kinds of shit. And I'm going, man. I, I need some Geritol or something because I'm way behind. Man, those people are, those people kick ass, man. Look at all this shit they're getting done, and I'm like, yeah, I can't barely. It's like this is molasses world. I can't get shit done. But that's what's gonna happen. They'll see you looking like a really dull, slow fucktard, and you'll see them as, wow, wow, wow. Look at them go. You just don't need all this time dilation shit. You don't need all this woo-woo. It's about as simple as thinking about how fast little ant brains are working, right? You can watch ants and you can say, look, little arms are moving really fast. Everything's happening really fast for them because they have a different kind of metabolism. They're sensing the world much quicker than you are. Their reflexes are boom, 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 really quick compared to your reflexes. There's no time dilation. There's just quick or slow metabolism, and when you get in a ship and go really fast, your metabolism fucktards. Well, the answer lies in the details. When your twin turns around, she has to accelerate, which means she's... See, that's another bogus part. <clears throat> you, you know, you could do this theoretically. Obviously, you would have to accelerate to get moving. But you could just use a planet out here, a sun out here. And you can turn around by just swinging into the gravity because you'll, whatever acceleration you do as you go into the gravity, you'll give it back as you leave. So you'll end up going exactly the same speed, you know, if you don't spend any amount of real time in the gravity. And uh, you'll just slingshot. <laughs> you'll, you'll, and it'll only be a, a, a fraction of the trip time. And so you really can't count that as a huge amount of directional difference so it's really not significant the fact that you spent you know one millionth of the trip accelerating won't have much to do with the um, fact that it was velocity that um, slowed you down no longer in an inertial reference frame while she accelerates and so special relativity no longer applies to her it's not as simple as saying your twin sees you make a round trip and you see your twin make a round trip it's not a symmetric problem like that, because when your twin accelerates, we can tell the difference between the physics that might happen in those two frames. Again, it, it, it really doesn't, it, it, the whole trip, you're going to be able to tell the difference. The whole, like I said, if this person is, as they're perceiving you, based on the clock, see again, you just have to have the standard clock in the image, and then the person will be able to see it. You'll see the clock blinking really fast. You say, man, these seconds are really ticking. I got, man, I don't, I'm, I gotta get moving. And they'll see the, you know, the rest of the world is still moving by that that clock. And you're just going to be sensing, wow, I'm I'm moving so slow. The clocks are moving faster. But it's only the ass, the broken clocks in your cab that are they're broken. The real clock is the neutron star you can both look at, or whatever they're called. The blinky things. She will feel the acceleration during the turnaround, and you will not. So when she gets back, she will agree with you that you are 30 and she is 26. Well, whatever. No, she won't. Because, well, anyway, I'm just saying, you're, you're going to know, you're going to recognize by just seeing that 
standard clock. So just put a standard clock in this thought experiment and she's going to know I'm fucked up. <laughs> yeah, she's going to. One last question. What's happening to the clocks during the period of acceleration? We still get time dilation, but we have to use a different set of rules from general relativity. General relativity states that clocks run slower in accelerated reference frames. So, so again, it's that. See, that's where general relativity is wrong, because that's only true for acceleration in a curve, in a circle. So, see, that's because the velocity doesn't show. Your velocity from the acceleration doesn't reveal itself. The only acceleration being revealed is your acceleration in one dimension. So if I let you go in gravity, right, if you're spinning in gravity, so as soon as you say you're spinning in gravity, it has a velocity, but its velocity is a lie because that's only revealing its velocity in one direction. You're actually moving down and then over. That's your real velocity. And so all your motion in the other dimension is not being revealed in your velocity because you're only counting the one vector. I mean, it just turns out that way. That in, in terms of being able to measure velocity, you can't do it when so, it's, you know, you can't do, you can't see real velocity in gravitational acceleration. Where if the acceleration was not gravitational, you could you would see the velocity because you'd see yourself if you had to steer so there was no gravity and you had to steer in a round circle you would see yourself turn your wheels you would see yourself not going straight and you would see yourself saying I must be going that way because I'm going that way and what you're really doing is you're going this way and then that way and this way and then that way. That's what your quanta are doing. They're moving in a square universe and they have to make full steps in dimensions. So there's no, they can't avoid actually doing the down as a full measure of time. So that's what's fooling you is that in a, in a gravitational acceleration, you don't see it in a real acceleration where you have to actually make your movement. You'll see that, oh yeah, I can see what I'm really doing because my wheels on my car are turned. I can see that what's really happening is that I'm spending some time with my wheels. See, this, this angle that you have your wheel at to go around in a circle, that angle really represents, for one second I went this way, for one second I went that way. For one second I went this way. For one second I went that way. That's what it really represents as your real condition. This is just an illusion in a sense because the quanta are really doing this and then that and then this and then that and they can't escape that. And that's your real velocity. And you lose it as soon as you, <laughs> that's the catch. You lose that extra velocity the minute you leave the gravity because now your wheels aren't turned, right? So when you leave the gravity, your wheels are now straight, right? You have to straighten your wheels to leave the gravity, right? To, if to stop spinning, to stop going around a curve, you have to turn your wheels straight. So you lose all of that other dimension movement. You let it go. You only have it so Einstein's wrong in that all acceleration isn't the same and the acceleration you produce when you have to create the force is um, how to say this well it's probably gonna be like I said you're still not gonna yeah, you'll see it in the time it takes. So that's the, there will be a difference. I'm just trying to think if your, your speed doesn't change when you leave a spiral you've been in and you turn your wheel straight, you're still doing the same thing. You're still releasing 
the acceleration you put in turning the wheel. So again, it's just, you will be able to see it because you'll be able to see yourself turning the wheel. So that's all I'm saying. So in a frame where you have to produce the acceleration and gravity's not producing it, you'll see the mechanism that's producing the acceleration. So you will be able to tell the difference. You won't, maybe you won't feel the difference, but you'll be able to tell the difference. You'll be able to detect it, let me put it that way. So while your twin is turning around, her clock runs slower, and she sees the same thing. She sees your clock running faster than hers, so you're aging quicker. It's during this period of acceleration that you become the older twin. Now this phenomenon of time dilation in an accelerated reference frame is related to time dilation in a gravitational field. <clears throat> right, but that's what you just did there, is that you have to create incredible acceleration to overcome the effects of special relativity. So these general relativity effects of acceleration really require, again, that you have to be in the stronger gravity. You have to do the harder, the steps have to get longer going down for it to be actually more distant. So in minor amounts of acceleration, those little tiny steps will be pretty much a straight line. General relativity says that clocks run slower in gravitational fields, as you may have seen occur in the movie Interstellar. You can get... No, I didn't see that, but whatever. Uh, they probably, I, I, you know, probably should watch some of these movies just to say, gee, that's bullshit. Time dilation and other strange things occurring during different forms of motion. Special relativity... Well, again, so let's just be clear. There's nothing strange about the idea that if I'm bouncing a basketball and then somebody says, Gary, bounce it going that way, that strangely, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do it exactly as fast. Well, the dancing analogy works even better. But if I'm dancing as fast as I can and somebody says, Gary, go that way, I'm just not going to be able to dance as fast as I was dancing because I have to use some of the time I was using doing this dance to go extra time in that other dimension and I can't get that for free I can only steal motion from motion in other dimensions so I can never get it from somewhere else to go in one dimension you have to take the motion out of the motion in the other dimensions and we're always moving in all three dimensions it's the nature of quanta they never stop and the twin paradox are just the tip of the iceberg. Well, whatever. Uh, if they're just the tip of the iceberg, it's an iceberg made out of, you know, some sort of toxic mind waste. Um, so anyway, do it. What else do I want to get to? Yeah, maybe I'll cut you a break and leave it at that. I don't think. Um, so, so the real, you know. You know, so, so when they use this light clock, I mean, the point is, is they're saying, um, <clears throat> you know, that you would be sitting in your spaceship, and let's say I put a hole in the spaceship just to make the light clock, and, and let's use a tennis ball, and let's take away gravity, I mean, uh, atmosphere, and so I throw a tennis ball into your spaceship through this hole, and then your spaceship moves, I mean, it's all about whether the person inside the spaceship moves with the spaceship. If they don't move with the spaceship, they'll see that this hole that the ball came in just flew away. <laughs> okay? And the ball is still moving straight, and it's going to hit the back wall of this spaceship, not here. It's, it's going to hit way down here. The spaceship's going to move, and it's going to hit there, but the ball goes straight. So, so there's no mystery of this, this, this angular thing. And, you know, understand that it, it, when you go the speed of light, this angle becomes, you end up with a, a, a Sosceles triangle here. You end up with, you know, same angles here. This angle ends up being a 45-degree a angle. And that's, you know, as much as you can pull out of this, this, this distance change. So you basically, but you're still, this is the full distance. And so what they're doing in the math, they're taking this distance okay, that, that you traveled in this direction. This is, say, say the light clock did this. It goes down and goes up. You're, you're adding this distance for their triangle-y thing. Um, and what they're doing is 
they're only taking the hypotenuse of, you know, a triangle with half that distance. So they're taking the hypotenuse of this triangle, which is much less than this distance. So, in my opinion, they're not getting the real, they're not getting the true, they're not getting the absolute velocity. They're, they're breaking it by assuming some sort of percentage. Because like I said, if, the fl if I move you, if I move your matter, the speed of light, the fact is your matter goes transparent in the sense that it's no longer, you don't have any components in the other two dimensions. You're entirely in that other dimension. And so you can't pretend that's okay that you have this, you know, this other dimension stuff anymore. It's gone. Um, you don't experience any time. No time at all happens. You're frozen. That's being frozen. Okay, moving the speed of light, that's absolute zero in terms of m your metabolism. You are frozen. And that's the truth of it. And the fact that there's a proportional relationship, the fact is, is that that absolute fact that if I move all of your quanta in one direction, they become photons, they become energy moving in a direction, and you, as a functioning thing in three dimensions, are now frozen in, th in two of the dimensions. You have zeros. So you're just one thing moving in one direction. That absolute fact means that it can't be the hypotenuse of that angle. It has You have to measure the full square. So the, the real, this is what they're saying is the dilation component, this hypotenuse, which is shorter than this distance. Okay, so the, they take this distance is longer than this distance, quite obviously. You can sort of understand that. This is the real distance, and they're breaking it by taking the hypotenuse. They really have to count this full distance. This is your actual distance, and this defines your actual velocity. Actual. The part that's relevant to your function. Okay, so I think that's enough. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's anything else to say. Um, yeah, I, it's just to, you know, to, to create this, um, whatever you call that, right triangle, you know, this is the right angle here. You end up with a right angle if you're going the speed of light. Um, and it, that angle gets smaller as you're going less than the speed of light, obviously. Um, so this might, someplace in this math, I might be able to catch an error they're making. Because taking that hypotenuse, I think, is an error. So they're underestimating time dilation. But it might just be... No, it's, it's got to be an underestimate. Because the logic, like I said, the logic of stating that if I move all your quanta, if I move your matter, the speed of light, that means every single element of you has to be going that way in that direction. So I've taken all, I've stole all the movement in the other two dimensions and frozen you. And so that's a complete conversion. Yeah, that's enough. I don't think there's anything else to add. This is, um, yeah. <laughs> Standard clock. Standard. I mean, they know what a standard thing is, right? They, they do this in astronomy, right? They, they go to try to find a, a standard light source, you know, a brightness. So then they can tell how bright, how far away things are based on how much light they're getting, how many photons per unit of time. And so they can get some idea of how far away something is if they have some standard light bulb they can put in different um, distances. And I don't know why they just don't do this with that, this thought experiment. Just make it understandable that both people will ever be able to see a common clock, and the common clock is going to make it clear that time isn't getting broken. Something else is. Okay. Till next time. But there's no space, time, dimensions. I mean, they do this, and they, they just create this this fake dimension. There's only three dimensions. Up, down, forward, back, left, right. That's it. Time is in a dimension. Space is in a dimension. These are not real dimensions. They aren't 
in any way related to those components, and they have nothing to do with the equals, the, the con conservation that takes place with those three vectors. Space and time have nothing to do with those three vectors. You can't, you can't do math across those dimensions. The three standard dimensions, you can do math across them. You can't do math from time and space. Not possible. It's not the same thing. It's not convertible. It's, uh, I'm trying to think of an analogy, but, you know,